All right, we want to take a look at immunity for a minute. So guys, immunity is going to provide an individual with protection or defense against a disease. That is technically what your immune system is out to do. Now it does this in a number of ways. One way is it protects you from foreign invaders, and this is like microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, fungus, that kind of stuff. We also see that it helps remove debris and damaged cells. So if any tissue damage has taken place or in the process of destroying the foreign invader, there's debris, they're gonna come in and clean up the area. And they're also gonna do surveillance. They are taught, some of your immune system cells are taught, this is what your cells look like and this is what a foreign invader looks like. However, sometimes your cells mutate in like the case of cancer. And so these immune system cells are gonna be on the surveillance looking for any of those changes that might occur and get rid of those cancer cells, hopefully before they become a big problem. So ultimately, this is the kind of role of the immune system. And that's of course, if it's all working properly. Now, when we look at the structures of the immune system, these are also gonna be a lot of the structures that are part of the lymphatic system. They kind of work together. One of the things that the lymphatic system does is it has these vessels that run all through the body like you see here in the green, and they're there to help pull in any extra fluid or things that may get into or in between your tissues. As they do this, this fluid's gonna get pumped back eventually to the heart, but it'll get filtered before that point. So you'll notice in certain locations like the neck and in the armpit area or the groin area, there's like concentrations of these little um, nodes. They're called lymph nodes. And they're there to filter, trap, and then destroy anything that does not belong. Okay, so using again the white blood cells, they're going to help do that. We also have some other structures that are specialized that are also there to trap, filter, and destroy. And those are with the tonsils and adenoids. Also, we have the um, Pryor's patches in the appendix. The spleen also plays a role in the immune system, as well as the thymus gland and the bone marrow. Now, the reason the thymus gland and the bone marrow are listed here is because they are responsible in either making or training your specific immune system. So when we look at the bone marrow, the bone marrow is actually gonna make all of your white blood cells because that's where the stem cells are located in your body. But some of those are gonna to go to the thymus gland to be trained. They're gonna be trained in knowing what your cells look like versus what your cells don't look like, and that's where our specific immunity is going to come into play, specifically with the T cells, which we'll talk about in a minute. So guys, I have a flow chart here that kind of shows you how the immune system is broken down. It's broken down into two branches. We have the innate or the non-specific immune response. This is the natural immune response and this is the one that everybody is born with. It consists of your first and second line of defense. On the other hand, we have the specific immune response. This is the adaptive or the acquired response. It's the one that you um, develop over time. Okay, as you're exposed to things, as you come in contact with the different invaders, your, this part of your immune system is gonna change, and this is what makes yours different than even mine. And this is the third line of defense. So let's take a closer look at that first line of defense. The first line of defense are your physical barriers. This includes your skin, as well as the normal flora you have on your skin, which is the normal bacteria and even the bacteria that's in you that is normally there. It's gonna also help protect you by outcompeting the invaders. We also have the mucus and the cilia that's in the mucous membranes. This mucus is there to help trap again and filter and so is the cilia, okay? So to again, help with being a barrier so things can't necessarily gain access into your body. We also have your hair. Hair is located in a number of areas and it's there for a reason again to trap. We also see a washing that can take place. This is where we have any kind of fluid that's gonna dilute invaders and help wash it away. This includes like your tears, urination, defecation, and even vomiting has a purpose for this. Now there are some chemical secretions that also play a role in this first line of defense. This is like your gastric juice that's in your stomach. Again, it's very acidic, and so bacteria and even other invaders don't really like that. And so it's a way for, again, to help destroy anything before it gets too deep into your body. Um, the vagina has the same kind of thing with the pH being more acidic. Again, not allowing and kind of being hostile to potential foreign invaders. 
We also see that there is going to be an enzyme activity that's present in a lot of your body fluids like your perspiration or your sweat, your tears, and even your saliva. This lysozyme is an enzyme that actually helps break down the cell walls of bacteria. And so again, these are all things that we're born with and this is your first line of defense. Now if something gets past that first line of defense, our second line has to kick in. The second line of defense includes inflammation and fever, and we're going to talk more about inflammation in another video. Also, we see phagocytic activation. This is going to be certain white blood cells that are going to be what we call phagocytes. They are going to end up eating or consuming the invader and destroying them inside of their own cell. It's kind of like Pac-Man. They Pac-Man it, they eat it, and then they destroy it. And these are like your neutrophils and your macrophages. We also see there's a set of chemicals called um, complement that are constantly going through your body. These are inactive most of the time, but if they get triggered by some sort of um, injury or invader, complement one is going to trigger complement two, then three, it's like a cascade event, like a domino effect, until finally the complement helps slow down that invader so the rest of your immune system can catch up. We also see in the second line of defense, there's the production of interferon. Interferon is a kind of chemical message that's going to do what we call chemotaxis. It's kind of like an SOS call where damage has taken place. The cells will release this in order to bring in more reinforcements and more help um, from the other parts of your immune system, specifically the third line of defense. Now, when we look at the third line of defense, this is the specific line, and this one adapts and changes. And the key players here are the lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are going to be made in your bone marrow, and then they're gonna be trained. And they are either gonna become T cells or B cells. Now, T cells are responsible for the cell mediated side of this type of immunity. They're really good at fighting viral infections, um, protozoa and helminths, which are worms. On the other hand, B cells are more of a humoral type of, of um, immunity. This one is going to be good against toxins, viruses, and bacteria. Now let me kind of explain a second here. When we look at the T cells and they do cell mediated, this is like hand to hand combat. This is when the T cell is gonna come and it's actually going to be on the front line fighting other cells that may be um, invaded, okay? On the other hand, when we look at the B cells, the humoral side, they're going to produce antibodies. Antibodies are kind of like missiles or arrows where they're gonna fight more from a distance and they're gonna shoot those arrows at the invader or the infected cell and they're still gonna help do damage, but they're just doing it in different ways. One's kind of the on the ground troops while the other one is maybe dropping bombs if you were to look at it in that sense. All right, so both of them are helping fight the invader, they just are doing it in different ways ways. So if we take a look here again, this just shows you the immunity. The innate is the one you were born with. This is the first and second line of defense. We have the adaptive required, and this is your third line of defense. And then we have the cell mediated and the antibody or humoral mediated. If we look at the cell mediated, guys, there's several types of T cells that are present in your body. Some of them are known as cytotoxic T cells. Those are the ones that are gonna go and do the hand-to-hand -hand combat. They're gonna do what you see here in the picture. They're going to consume and do phagocytosis if need be on the invader. They're gonna help destroy infected cells for the greater good of the organism, um, but they're gonna be the ones who are actually on the ground fighting. We also see that there's some helper T cells that are also formed. Helper T cells are actually gonna connect these two branches of the adaptive immunity. They're gonna be the, the link of communication. That way the T cells know what the B cells are doing and vice versa. If that line of communication is shot, it's destroyed, this creates a huge problem. And this is actually what HIV does. HIV is a virus that affects the T helper cells and it knocks out the communication. So both branches of these are no longer communicating and so when an invader comes in, it's almost like the cell mediated is like, oh, the humoral will take care of it. And the humoral is like, oh, the cell mediated will take care of it and then nothing happens. So both sides start to get weaker and weaker until you no longer have that immune system. 
The last type of T cell we want to talk about are the ones that are actually the memory cells. Memory cells remember what they have fought before, therefore they can fight it quicker and more effectively the next time they are exposed. On the other hand, when we look at the humoral side, this is going to be made from B cells. B cells, when they get triggered in order to make antibodies, we see that they are going to become plasma cells. Plasma cells then make these plasma type proteins that we call antibodies. Antibodies then are going to go and help attack the invader. However, some of these cells also turn into B memory cells, again, remembering what they have come in contact with before, allowing for the next time for the, the defense to be made quicker. Okay, and so again, these guys are kind of working together. Now there are different types of antibodies based on their size, where they're located, and they kind of have a little different functions, but they all are there to help initiate and, and they're all there to help destroy the invader and, and aid you in being able to survive that pathogen or that infection or whatever is causing that problem in your body. All right, so technically we want an immune system that is normal. A person with a normal immune system has the ability to fight infections efficiently and effectively without necessarily getting really, really sick. Um, and they're able to do this without much problem. However, we kind of have that middle of the road being the normal and we have two kind of extremes. On one side, we have the suppressed immune system. The suppressed immune system is gonna be the one that cannot fight the invader. It's not able to, and this is because there's a deficiency. Something is wrong with the immune system. So here, that's, there's two types of immunodeficiencies. There's primary, this means the individual was born with the problem. They were missing some or all of their immune system components. Since this is the case, a lot of times they, their immune system does not develop normally and they are going to be very susceptible to infections and other diseases. An example of this is skid. On the other hand, a secondary or acquired type of infection is one that you develop from something else. It weakens your immune system and making it ineffective. And this could be due from like cancer due to cancer treatments with chemotherapy. You could get it from taking immunosuppressant drugs if you've had a transplant and those kind of, we know that that's what's happening. But we also see this is exactly how HIV works. HIV is a virus that attacks the immune system cells, making them non-functional, causing your immune system to be depressed until finally it's gone. And then we call this AIDS. AIDS is Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. Okay, so that's where the acronym comes from. And, and once HIV gets to a certain point, we call that AIDS. On the other hand, we can have your immune system overreact. It can be exaggerated. This means it responds too much to an issue. So suppressed, it wasn't responding enough and exaggerated, it's responding too much. These are called hypersensitivities. There are different types of hypersensitivity. Some of them are acute, which means that once you're exposed to the issue, automatically your, your immune system is going to react and it's gonna overreact. On the other hand, chronic is gonna be something that happens kind of over time and it's gonna wear and tear on your body, okay? Now, when we look at this, there are four types of hyper, um, hypersensitivities. One is type one. This is like allergies and asthma. So when you're exposed to that allergen or whatever bothers you, you have a response. Your immune system overreacts because in reality, that peanut really didn't do anything to you. But the way your immune system reacted to that peanut, it could kill you. It's the same thing with a bee sting. A bee sting hurts. Yes, it's not pleasant, but it shouldn't kill you. How your body reacted to that bee sting is the issue. Okay, so it's an overreaction. Type two is a cytotoxic form of hypersensitivity. This is where the cells are gonna destroy other cells. And the main, the main example of this is a mismatched blood reaction. If you're type A blood and they gave you a type B blood transfusion, your body would react this way by destroying all those B cells because they do not belong. Type three is an immunocomplex issue, and this is where the immune system attacks something and it makes these complexes. And instead of absorbing them and dissolving them and getting rid of them, they start to build up in organs. This then triggers your immune system to fight it more because it causes inflammation. A lot of these, when we talk about type three, 
are types of immuno disorders where the immune system is going to attack itself. So we call that an autoimmunity where the immune system is attacking you when it shouldn't. One of the best examples here is systemic lupus erythromatosis. We also see there's a type four and this is a more delayed type of reaction. This one is gonna be with poison oak or ivy. You've been exposed in several hours or a day later, you get the rash, it didn't happen right away. We also see this sometimes with transplant reactions where they don't reject it right away. And so because of that, it's over time and the organ gets weaker and weaker until it no longer functions. And then another one is a TB test. We use this where you get injected, you then have to come back in several days to see if a reaction's taken place. And they're actually using this type of hypersensitivity to test you to see if you've had TB before. So these again are just some examples of suppressed versus exaggerated immunity. All right, so let's look at some risk factors here. Now, if you, of course, have a normal immune system, this could be that you have a good normal lifestyle in the sense of saying, you know, exercising, eating right, things like that. But there are some risk factors that can send you in each direction. So let's talk about the risk factors for the suppressed immunity first. These include age. Guys, the really young and the really old. In the really young, their immune system hasn't developed yet, especially that third line of defense, the acquired, it takes time. And so because of that, they're gonna be more vulnerable when they're very young. On the other hand, when we're very old, our immune system is tired. It doesn't like to work anymore as well. So because of that, they're also more susceptible. If a person has not been immunized, they can also be where they are more chances of having a suppressed immune system. Immunizations help you be able to build your immune system so that you are not threatened by certain common diseases. And if you don't have those immunizations, it actually can cause your immune system to be suppressed against those. Again, poor nutrition can cause an issue here. If you're not eating right, it can affect your immune system, as well as poor sanitation conditions. This could be, when we talk about sanitation, this could be where they're living in the sense of access to wa clean water and good food. It could also be due to not having good personal hygiene and like washing our hands and that sort of thing. This could contribute to a suppressed immune system. Some pollutants also cause issues with the immune system. These include things like smoke and heavy metal exposure. Chronic illnesses can also weaken your immune system because your body is tired of fighting and it's tired of dealing with something over and over again, so your immune system starts to weaken. These are gonna be things like diabetes, COPD. Some medical treatments can also cause a suppressed immune system. One of these is something we do for transplant patients where we put them on immunosuppressant drugs. Those drugs are supposed to make sure your immune system doesn't reject the organ. We also see cancer treatment could be one of these as well as well as cortisol shots. Cortisol shots are going to be a type of steroid and it can actually start to depress the immune system if you get too many of those. So there's some high risk behaviors that also cause you to have a higher risk of a suppressed immune system. This includes like unprotected sex because of HIV, that sort of thing. And also we talk about um, sharing needles. Okay, or drug use. Those types of things um, are going to put you at a higher risk of potentially having something that you come in contact with that will suppress your immune system. The last one for a suppressed immune system is pregnancy. While you're pregnant, your immune system has a little bit harder time because your body is busy doing other things. On the other hand, for an exaggerated immune system, age could play a role in this. We also see race and ethnicity might as well. But one of the key things may be genetics because when we have an exaggerated immune system, and especially if a family member has lots of allergies, it could be something that has a genetic link to it. Another thing is the exposure. For whatever reason, when you were exposed to that food or that um, bee sting or that medication, your body overreacted. And so the next time you would be exposed, the reaction would happen again. So to decrease your risk of that exaggerated immune system occurring, we'd wanna keep you away from that irritant, whether it's a certain type of food, whether you don't need to take that type of medication again, whatever that may be. 
All right, so let's talk a little bit about assessment. How do we look at somebody and see if their immune system is suppressed or exaggerated, or if it's just normal? Now, when we look at assessment, you've always got to take a history. That history needs to include past medical history as well as current, and this includes medications they've taken, this includes treatments that they have had, because it could be a indica good indication of what might be going on. Another thing we always do in an assessment is a physical exam. Okay, we want to do a physical exam so that we can look for certain potential kind of red flags in a sense. Now, for a suppressed immune system, when you talk to the patient, you start to get a history and you get to know them a little bit with some information. A lot of times you may find that the individual has poor nutrition and this can cause wasting syndrome to happen where they start to lose lots of weight and their and their body starts to get tired, fatigued and they may just feel blah, which is like kind of like a malaise. They may also have wounds that don't heal properly, poor healing. This might mean that they stay open too long or they reopen on a regular basis, so there could be an issue with wound healing. Another are enlarged lymph nodes. If their lymph nodes are enlarged, it could be that their immune system is trying to fight something and it's not able to. They may also have frequent in infections. If they frequently have infections, it could be an issue. And also if they have what we call opportunistic infections, it could be an issue. Opportunistic infections are when something that's on you normally, like your normal flora, if it gets the opportunity to get inside and make you sick, it could cause what we call an opportunistic infection. Now, on the allergic or the exaggerated side of the immune system with allergies, they, the symptoms in the assessment could be very mild. It could just be that they have sneezing and watery eyes. They could have a scratchy throat. Um, they may even have like congestion in their sinuses or it could get very severe. So when we look at a severe exaggerated allergy reaction, there's rashes, swelling, and the patient could even go into shock and we call that anaphylactic shock. On an autoimmune issue though, we do see that there's a big range of what could be happening with them. Because of the fact that autoimmune disorders are so specific to what organ is being affected, a lot of times they are mimicking other things. When we talk about lupus, lupus mimics lots of other disorders because a lot of times it presents itself as a liver problem at first or a kidney problem, but that's just which organ is being attacked at the time. And so sometimes it's hard to diagnose autoimmune disorders because of that. However, a lot of times if a patient has an autoimmune disorder, they'll have pain, fatigue, and they may even have fevers. Now, before we get to treatment, I'd like to talk briefly about some diagnostic tests because assessment is fine in what we're kind of seeing and getting information from the patient, but sometimes we've got to do some other tests that are going to be more specific. So when we look at diagnostic tests, we will see that blood tests are going to be very helpful here. And there's a number of tests that be, can be done with a blood sample, one being a CBC. We want to do a complete blood count. This complete blood count is going to look at red blood cells. It's going to look at sedimentation rate of those red blood cells. It's going to look at white blood cells and differentiate them of how many of each kind do you have. It's going to give us a lot of information. We also see that we could take the plasma and even the proteins that are found in there and do some other tests. These tests include like the fluorescent anti-nuclear antibody test. It's going to tag it and it will light up and let us know that something is there. A C-reactive protein test, rheumatoid factor test. Now these are going to be helpful a lot of times when looking for like autoimmune issues or also severe inflammation that's taking place. We also see the ELISA and Western blot tests. Those are going to take out some of the DNA or the extract some of the nucleic acids. We can run the test and this is how we identify um, if HIV is present. So there are specific tests that can be run, um, but a lot of times they're going to come from a blood, doing a blood panel. We're going to take some blood and do a lot of different tests with it. We also see that if an allergy is going to be the issue, we can do some allergy testing so we can pinpoint exactly what's potentially causing the problem. We can do this through skin testing and a lot of times then they might want to do desensitization with that where they want to desensitize you to hopefully not get that big reaction anymore when you're exposed. Genetic testing may need to be done and then organ function testing. So again, if it's a liver issue, we see the liver is being damaged, we may need to look at the liver enzymes and how they're being produced. If it's a kidney issue, we may want to do a, we want to look more at how the kidneys are producing the urine and if they're struggling. And so we may do some more organ specific type of testing at that point. <clears throat> 
now that we have testing out of the way and we might know more about what's going on, we want to talk a little bit about like treatment and management. One of these things we want to look at is primary prevention. Now, primary prevention, guys, is proactive. This is stuff we want to do before there's even an issue. This is the stuff we should be doing to try to help keep us from having an immune problem. These are going to be things like vaccines because they'll help boost your immune system, avoiding high risk situations or behaviors like with unprotected sex, drugs, needle use, that kind of thing. Having an overall kind of healthy lifestyle, good nutrition, exercise routine, good sleep, good sanitation and hygiene, that kind of thing. Now, secondary prevention is where there's more of a screening. Are there different tests that we can do periodically to screen and look for there being an issue? This would be only really done in this case for HIV. And this is again only done for individuals who have been exposed or at high risk of exposure. So they may run this every now and then on somebody who works with HIV patients all the time in order to just determine to make sure that you haven't, haven't accidentally been exposed and, or something like that. Other interventions though are going to be very specific to the problem. Okay, so it depends on what we find out with our diagnostic tests. That kind of intervention or treatment is going to be very specific to what we see.